As long as humans have been recording history, we've been asking questions. How did we get here is one that has been asked many times, and throughout the ages there have been many different methods of determining the answer. In more recent years, we humans have been seeking to discover the origins of life through science. Science seeks to learn about the natural world through observation and experimentation. Science doesn't address anything supernatural or that can't be proven. We use science to answer questions through the scientific method. The scientific method is a series of specific steps, but it boils down to asking a question, forming a hypothesis and testing it, and determining if your results support your hypothesis. Then share your findings so people can ask more questions. In research on the origins of life, there are two main ways that scientists employ the scientific method. The first is the top-down method. This method relies on the analysis of the tree of life and the many types of similarities and differences between all organisms. In the tree, the most recent organisms are at the very tips of the branches. At the bottom of the tree is a theoretical organism called LUCA, or the last universal common ancestor. This organism is the theoretical first living thing from which all other life on Earth is descended. Using the top-down method, researchers study organisms living today and then work backwards to learn more about LUCA. The second method is called bottom-up. This method studies the conditions present on early Earth and tries to replicate the process that life would have arisen by. Researchers study very closely the chemicals, molecules, and compounds that would have been present before life began and how they would have interacted with each other under different conditions. Then, they try to produce these conditions and interactions in a lab, with the ultimate goal of replicating the origin of life. One of the most influential experiments in the study of the origins of life was a bottom-up experiment conducted by Stanley Miller and Harold Urey in the 1950s. Unfortunately for Harry, today it's known as the Miller experiment. The experiment sought to replicate the conditions present on Earth at the time that life originated. In their setup, they had one bulb representing the ocean connected to a larger bulb representing the atmosphere. Below the atmosphere bulb, the glass was cooled to condense the contents, and then the water cycled back to the ocean bulb where it was heated again, and the process was repeated. At the start of the experiment, the ocean bulb contained water, and the atmosphere bulb contained gases that were at the time thought to have been common on young Earth. Because of the repeated evaporating and condensing of water, their setup mimicked the water cycle of a young Earth. Young Earth also had frequent lightning storms. Two electrodes were added to the atmosphere bulb to simulate this. Then, the system was allowed to run. Eventually, the water turned a pinkish-red color. They discovered that the lightning had powered reactions that produced amino acids, the building blocks of DNA. Since the Miller experiment, much further study has been done on how life and the building blocks of it could have originated. This research has exposed a hole in the Miller experiment. The chemicals that were used in the Miller experiment for the atmosphere of primitive Earth are not all of the chemicals that have since been confirmed to have existed at the time. So if amino acids weren't produced exactly how they were in the Miller experiment, how did they originate? One answer is this equation. Carbon dioxide and hydrogen gases were both present in the primitive Earth atmosphere, and they produced formaldehyde, an extremely important player in chemical evolution. But this reaction needs energy to go, and if lightning literally did not strike, how could this reaction have taken place? The answer is the sun. The expression, a ray of sunshine, is more accurate than you might think. The sun is constantly shooting out energy, but in tiny packet form. One such packet of energy is called a photon. Though each photon individually doesn't have a huge amount of energy, the combined energy of all of the photons is pretty impressive. Today, the energy from the sun isn't enough to power the reaction. This is mostly due to the ozone layer. The ozone layer acts as a shield, stopping most of the sun's energy before it gets to the Earth's surface. However, back in time, baby Earth didn't have as large of an ozone layer. Therefore, it had a weaker shield and more of the sun's energy could reach the Earth. Enough energy to make the formaldehyde reaction possible. This information and energy source inspired one of the two main models of chemical evolution today, called the prebiotic soup model. This theory begins with the ocean. Primitive Earth's oceans were composed of many chemicals, like carbon monoxide, nitrogen, water, ammonium, and hydrogen, and carbon dioxide. The energy from the sun powered reactions between these chemicals and formed more and more complex compounds, like hydrogen cyanide, 
and formaldehyde. Then, heat powered more reactions, forming even more complex compounds like glycine and ribose, both of which are extremely important to life on Earth. The other main model of chemical evolution also starts in the ocean, but a little bit deeper down, at hydrothermal vents. This model is called surface metabolism. One important reaction in the surface metabolism model is between carbon dioxide and hydrogen to form acetic acid. But to be feasible, this reaction and many others would have needed a catalyst to provide an alternate route for the reaction with a lower activation energy. Minerals in the hydrothermal vents acted as this catalyst. Inside the vents, the same simple molecules were present that were present in the prebiotic soup model. Here, the minerals in the vent catalyzed many spontaneous reactions between these simple molecules, creating more complex molecules. In even smaller chambers in the vents, the minerals continued to catalyze reactions between the simple molecules. But because of the high heat and pressure in the vents, the products of these reactions reacted again to form even more complex molecules, like acetic acid, methane, and ribose. The origin of life on Earth is a fascinating and complex topic. It can be explored via scientific inquiry using both top-down and bottom-up methods. The Miller experiment was an early and influential experiment where primitive Earth conditions were replicated and amino acids were produced. Today, two major models of this chemical evolution are the probiotic soup model, where the sun's energy and heat powered reactions to create increasingly complex molecules, and the surface metabolism model, where hydrothermal vents provided minerals to catalyze reactions between simple molecules, and then the high concentration and heat in the vents enabled more complex molecules to be formed. This process of discovery is an ongoing one, and though we know a lot more than we used to, we still don't have all the answers. So, I guess we'll just have to keep asking questions.